All right, everyone, crowdsourcing personal finance since 2017. We're going to pick up with our Household Sofi series. Welcome to the ultimate crowdsource personal finance show. This is Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, everyone, today we are going to be sharing a episode with Troy and Lindsay, part of our Households of Phi series, and we were able to connect them with Grumpus Maximus to discuss the health of their pension. Very excited to share this episode with you, and to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. Yeah, this is uh, this is a good episode. I'm definitely interested and excited to share with the community here. So this is uh, Troy and Lindsay. They're one of our eight households of Phi uh, households, I guess, that we're following over the course of years as they found Phi, right? They found Phi in 2020, and we introduced them in episode 221. So you can always find that on your podcast player or at choosevi.com slash 221. And yeah, they're married. They have one kid. They recently paid off $88,000 in debt. And what next, right? They're trying to figure out how do I move forward on the path to Phi? And then actually I got a chance to sit down with them on episode 241. We kind of went through their expenses. We talked about calculating their Phi number, which it looks to be somewhere in the vicinity of, of about a million dollars. And, you know, again, they were going to sit down, they were going to run some calculations, they were going to figure some things out. And one of those major aspects is Lindsay is a teacher and she has a potential pension and they're trying to figure out, hey, what does this mean for us? What do we need to consider? Do we really want Lindsay working for 25, 30 plus years to get this pension? Is it worth it? Right, Jonathan? And, you know, when we have questions about pensions and worth versus worth it, you obviously think about Grumpus Maximus, who is a friend of the show. He has written a book actually for Choose of I Publishing called The Golden Albatross, which he talks very specifically and in depth about pension. So this was the uh, logical person to hook up with Troy and Lindsay for this conversation. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and kick off this episode. And I just think there's a couple things to pay attention to. This episode was uh, of particular interest because they were actually talking about, you know, selfishly for me and you, Brad, because they were talking about the Virginia retirement system. And I know plenty of people that are a part of that system. And, and if obviously, if it's one-to-one, you're going to be very interested in what Grumpus shares. I mean, Grumpus really did some research and was able to quickly provide just an assessment of what this retirement plan was. But I also think there's some there's a great conversation around embedded in this around how healthy is your pension and where do you go to access that data in a quick manner? And then how do you interpret the data and turn data into information? So keep, make sure you pay attention to that. I think it'll scale to you regardless of what the name of your pension actually is and give you a better foundation for really understanding how healthy it is and what the value of it is in really a post-COVID era or a COVID era. All right, with that, uh, let's get into it. So, hey, I'm I'm Grumpus Maximus, obviously. Could you guys just give me the quick background, like how old you are? I saw that you work in the Virginia retirement system, but just kind of give me Are you dual income? You have kids, all that kind of stuff. So I can have a general idea of what your situation is. So my name is Lindsay. And I'm Troy. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Troy. (laughs) Hi. (laughs) And um, just a little background about us. I am about to be 33. I always remember after my 30s, I don't remember how old I am. But yeah, so I'm 32 and uh, we have one son. He is 15 months old and I am currently a teacher. And like, you know, you know, I have a VRS retirement account and it's my seventh year teaching. Okay, great. And uh, my name is Troy. I am an IT professional. I am 34 years old. So we are both working and we're both bringing in an income currently. Okay, but you don't have access to a pension. 
Negative. I'm a government contractor. So, okay. so just my background real quick. I'm Grumpus Maximus. Obviously, that's my pseudonym, not my real name. I'm a retired military officer. I did 20 and, and then retired. I have a wife and two kids. We are currently living in New Zealand and uh, trying to stay here if we can, if we can get a permanent resident visa. So I went through this whole process of trying to figure out if I should stay or go from a pensionable job rather late in my career. I don't know if you've had time to either check out my website or, or read the book that Choose FI published. But if not, just the background is, hey, I suffered a mental breakdown at uh, year 16-ish, 17-ish, PTS linked, post-traumatic stress linked uh, mental breakdown. So I was very late in my career when I had to kind of go through all the calculations of whether or not this job is worth staying or, or leaving. I ultimately made the decision to stay, but not before. I worked out methods for calculating all the payments of my future pension, kind of how much that would add up to, plus the other benefits like health and stuff like that. Uh, and then weighing it against, you know, my mental health, my happiness, my family's happiness and all that. So I can understand where you guys are at. I will say you are in a much better place than I was just starting off because you're doing this early. And as far as I can tell, hopefully you're not going through the same kind of stressors that I was. So good on you for starting early on this, because this is the much better way to approach it rather than waiting for life to pile up to where you, you break down and then you're stuck trying to navigate this. So again, my applause goes to you for being proactive. So VRS, let's just quick for whoever's going to be end up watching this is the Virginia Retirement System. Lindsay, which plan are you on? VRS 1, 2, or the hybrid 2? I'm Yeah, I'm on the option 2 plan. Okay. We, got little, we got our cheat sheet over here too. So. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So, you know, again, just for whoever's going to end up watching this or the listeners, a lot of pension plans these days have created different levels of the plan that have less and less features or a little bit less, less generous uh, because defined benefit plans are really expensive to provide, right? At the end of the day. The other thing we should probably define is that since you're in a Virginia retirement system, you're in a public plan. So, your contributions are contributing to that plan, but also taxpayers, your employer, therefore the taxpayer's money is also contributing to that plan, which you will ultimately, if you decide to stay until you vest, you will ultimately get to make yourself available of. So I guess the one question I wanted to start out with is what is driving your questioning now? Um, I think the biggest driver is our son, and also, I think COVID made us think of uh, thinking differently about our careers. I mean, COVID never happened. I would have not even considered the possibility of me even working from home or not even working at all or the possibility of homeschooling eventually. And so I think that was the, the biggest driver in my eyes. What about you, Troy? No, yeah, I just agree. Just um, you're seven years in and I think we were looking at your retirement system, just trying to play with the numbers and it wouldn't let you even retire before the age of 58 in the retirement calculator. So mm -hmm. it was just one of those things where it was so far in advance, it, it just errored out. The whole website errored out and it wouldn't even let you see what it would look like if you retired at 20 years in. you know, it made it so you had to stay in for, I think a little like over 30. Right. And then right. also finding the FI journey too. It's like, oh, we want to kind of play with the numbers a bit and see where we land. And the VRS system wouldn't allow us to do that at all. <laughs> yeah. Understandable. Uh, a lot of the websites have those fixed calculators in them. They're good for the traditional retiree and obviously a lot less flexible for, for those of us who are considering retiring early. I did do a little bit of research on VRS before we came on this call. It looks like 30 years is the standard full vestment period that you would have to work in order to get the full benefits. Mm -hmm. Now your partial vesting point is quite low at five years. It's not going to start paying out until you hit the uh, pension system's minimal retirement age at the earliest, which may be that 58 point, which is why the calculator is built that way. Of okay. course, if you draw earlier than what the plan two retirement age is, which I think for plan two is connected to your social security retirement age, if I'm not mistaken. So that's probably around 67, 68 for you. That means if you only wanted to work up to a partial vesting, however long, and then waited for that to kick in that, that partial pension that you earned, if you wanted all the money, you'd have to wait till 67, 68. 
if you decide to take it earlier, they will reduce the amount that you draw. They probably have some formula that takes it off by the number of years uh, that you want to start getting your payment earlier. That said, my research, uh, actually, let's start with your questions. Your very first question was, hey, mathematically, how do I calculate this? There are a number of different ways. Obviously, the website is one of them to calculate what your pension would potentially pay you. I don't know if it will calculate it over the lifetime or just show you the annual or monthly value that it would pay you. But that is going to be potentially the most accurate, although you guys are so far in advance, none of this is really going to be all that accurate because you're making a lot of assumptions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even if you use this, my most mathematical way that I've developed and put into the book and have on the blog, I still call it mathematic because you're making a lot of assumptions along the way. So, Mm -hmm. and I don't want people to forget that and fall in love with this specific number, but there is, you know, I have kind of a stair step system of like, how complicated do you want to get? If you want to get to an actual number that you think you would have to have invested, that would be the equivalent of what your pension would pay out at a certain point in the future, you can do that. It involves a lot of work as far as research goes into the number of benefits and things like that and what your benefits would be. But it also kind of involves you knowing what you're going to spend in retirement. Since you guys sound, uh, you're definitely on the younger end of the scale. You may or may not know, kind of have a projected (laughs) retirement budget, especially with a young kid. I know that gets harder. Again, a lot of guesswork involved. Do you guys track your spending on a monthly basis? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Have you done that for years and do you have that data? Yeah, we're, um, when we spoke with Brad last time, we discussed having a retirement budget shooting for around 4000 a month. Okay, so that's good. That's good. So you at least kind of know what you're shooting for. So that makes you eligible to figure out a few different ways of how important or how much this pension could do for you in potential retirement. Since you have an idea of the amount you might spend monthly, you can hopefully go on to the website's calculator and or do it yourself and figure out, hey, this would be the projected monthly income of this uh, pension. And then you can line up the two and see how big the gap is. I call that the gap number. You can do it on an annual basis or a monthly basis. But obviously, the more a pension covers the gap. So, I mean, the smaller the gap is because your pension covers, you know, 75% of your plan spending in retirement versus 50% of your plan spending in retirement, the pension gets more and more valuable, obviously, as the gap gets smaller. So that is one method for calculating the value of your pension too. And it's not very hard. It's definitely a less technical way. But again, just understand you're talking about multiple decades into the future. Inflation is going to have to play a role, although your pension, your potential pension has a COLA, a cost of living adjustment which hopefully negates inflation, which makes it a little more valuable than, than other pensions. I shouldn't say a little. It actually makes it quite more valuable than other pensions that don't because inflation won't be eating away at the value. Your purchasing power in retirement will stay the same as soon as those pension payments start. So some other ways, getting to kind of the least mathematical, but, but kind of maybe the most germane to your situation is you can simply just kind of line up, if you can see this, Oh, nice. <laughs> kind of line up, you know, the pros and the cons. I call this the uh, Grumpmatic method. I've also written about it on the blog and in the book. And you start stacking up all the objectively valuable features of a pension. So we already mentioned COLA. Yours, it does not look like it replaces Social Security. So that is valuable because you can also have Social Security income coming in. Many teachers' pensions do not, i.e. the pension is meant to replace Social Security. So it takes one leg of the three-legged retirement stool away, which people often talk about, and throws more eggs into one basket. But because yours doesn't, it's more valuable that way, in my opinion, because you have other things you can rely on in case the pension doesn't come through in the amount you expected it to. Mm -hmm. Yours has a lot of um, features, what are called OEPBs, Other Earned Pension Benefits. The list that they had on the website included life insurance, health insurance, which was incredibly valuable in the U.S. at least, where we don't have a socialized health care system. What are some other things? Oh, survivorship, that's mandatory. All pensions in the U.S. have to provide the option of survivorship. You don't have to take it. Do you guys know what survivorship is? Uh, yeah, I, I have a, a, 
brief understanding of it. So it would be the, the spouse would take over the, uh, what, like a portion or all of the pension, but you have to like pay almost like a monthly premium to earn that right. Yeah, exactly. So for my military pension, they would only allow us to, to cover up to 55% of our pension. So if I die, then my wife gets 55% monthly of what we were getting. But many pensions uh, allow you to cover the full amount if you want. It's just those monthly payments get more and more expensive. But, you know, there are cool little things. Uh, those are before tax payment. So what you have coming in after you make that monthly payment is a less amount. So it gets taxed less. So there are a lot of things that could go on to your pros and cons list in the balance. Now, you know, doing the pros and cons list, what I call the Grumpmatic method, you also need to take into account all your other personal issues. And I think that was getting to the second question you, you sent is like, hey, like, how do we consider everything else in our life in making this decision? And that's what this Grumpmatic method that I designed was meant to do. Sure, there is a way to get to a mathematical number, be it a rough estimate because of all the kind of future forecasting you have to do. But there is also a less mathematical way, uh, but kind of takes in a wider span of issues to include happiness, job satisfaction, whether or not you actually um, are worried about the pension coming through in the promised form because the pension system may or may not be fully funded. So that ends up kind of in this, if you build in your mind like this scale, you know, an equal balance scale like you used to see in the old days with all the pros on one side, including your emotional pros and your, your pensions objective pros, and then kind of the cons on the other, which include the features that might be missing from your pension, which it doesn't sound like there's many features missing from your pension, but maybe the funding status of your pension if it's not fully funded, which by the way, your pension is not, VRS is not fully funded. It's only funded at 75% right now. And then some of the emotional issues that goes into the con category, like maybe you're concerned about what the future of teaching is going to be like in a post-COVID world, or maybe you just don't like the job, you know, <laughs> and, and, and you're thinking about doing something else. And so then hopefully one kind of outweighs the other mentally in, in your mind. Actually, I encourage people to write it down on paper. And then you have this physical record here of why you're making your decision the way you're making it. You know, I am a big proponent of the fact that things like life happiness, fulfillment, spending time with your kids or the, your loved ones in your life should weigh in heavily to those decisions. And it shouldn't be purely a numbers-based decision. So those are two different ways, kind of that, that mathematic one where you can actually get to a rough order and magnitude of what you think you would have coming in over a lifetime, or you could reduce it to an annual or a monthly basis as well, versus this kind of more emotional, all-inclusive, holistic view of the Grumpmatic view. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think so. I think it makes a lot of sense. I guess our uh, question would be, I read, uh, I did, I, we do have your book. I was only able to get through the first part before uh, our coaching session today, but I saw that you went through this yourself and you made the call, but also I think I read in there that your wife was in a similar situation and she ended up doing something similar to what Lindsay's possibly talking about. Is there any way, like what, what kind of decisions led you guys there to determine that was what was right for your family? Yeah. So you're right. My wife and I, uh, we were dual income, no kids at one point, dinkies. <laughs> one of the main factors was we wanted to have kids. And my wife was a, a flight attendant. So, you know, that's kind of a hard job to have a family and then go and leave for a week at a time, which was what she was doing. So, you know, we, that way we had to come to a decision, kind of what's more important. The other issue was the Great Recession happened. You know, 2008, 2009 financial crash happened. And the industry that she was working in started uh, laying people off. Her company that she was working for offered a severance package, which was totally unheard of as all these other companies were cutting back. But the original owner was being forced out. He wanted to do something for the employees that had been there long term. So he convinced the board somehow to provide a, um, a severance package. So, you know, my wife continued to get paid at a reduced amount for a certain length of time, which essentially to us was them paying for us to go and have kids. Now, you may, you, you know, you're probably not going to be in that situation. There's not necessarily going to be a severance package. Mm -hmm. But it was really a family 
based decision though for us was, hey, we want to start a family. We want to, we want to have kids. It wasn't easy. The transition for my wife wasn't easy because let's see, we were in our we were in our mid to late thirties at that point, and she had worked from her early twenties her entire life. So the transition from having this career and, and being fully employed in a wage paying factor was a big adjustment for my wife. It was bumpy at first, and I won't lie because you know if you go from working to not working and you haven't kind of thought through the transition, you, you kind of immediately start questioning your self-worth and a lot of other things that go with it. But, you know, once our first son came along and, you know, she took on the role of the full-time parent, a lot of that went to the wayside, really. But, you know, it, we went and did some marriage counseling and stuff in between to A, make sure we were ready and make sure that she was ready mentally to go that way. So yeah, I'm not going to lie and say, hey, it worked perfectly for us because it didn't. It, it took some work. Uh, so you need to be prepared for that too. Although I wouldn't necessarily let that be a con. That's just something, I think, reality of the situation of, um, of deciding to do something like that. But that's how we made our decision. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, this is Andrew from the Choose a Five team. I hope you're enjoying the show. We're going to get right back to it after these quick messages. So let's see. You had several more questions here. Uh, one was, hey, where do you find out the decent amount of information? So you, th that's a good question. That's crazy because um, I've been looking at this stupid site for weeks trying to figure out some information on this. And I think I was only able to provide you the age that Lindsay could retire at, the date that that would be on, and then how much we get a month and then like what is currently in there. And I looked all over the stupid site. And then I think, you know, I don't know how long you looked at it. I'm sure you found a way easier than me, but you've already got so much more information than I was able to do. Are you just magic? I have the benefit of knowing what I'm looking for. <laughs> so, you know, I have been doing this now for over three years. And there was a point in time when I only knew about my own particular pension, but I've expanded that knowledge, especially since I started this business program I'm doing now, a master's over here in New Zealand. And I, any time I get or any chance I get to kind of make the topic uh, of my next essay or my next, you know, homework assignment pensions, I take advantage of that. So I am now kind of in this full-time capacity of studying pensions whenever I, I get the chance. So A, I have the benefit of knowing what I'm looking for. B, I also have the benefit of knowing that uh, Boston College runs this thing called the Center for Retirement Research, CRR, and they run a public plans database. Now, it doesn't have every single public pension plan in there, but it does have all the major state ones and some of the major city and county ones. And of course, Virginia Retirement System is the one for Virginia state workers and pretty much a wide swath of public employees. So of course, it's in there. And so if you go to um, CRR's website, the main page is publicplansdata.org. So all one word, publicplansdata. Org. You'll get to the public plans database and you'll see the state by state map thing up here and you click on that and then you go click on Virginia and then you'll see I think they list three of the pension systems in Virginia VRS and, and two others and that's where I got my initial data from because it gives you this overall view of what the pension plan looks like you know from the number of retirees it has to the amount of assets they have and the funding status that all important funding status. So it is a great one-stop resource to kind of get the general view before you dive into the specifics. So if you haven't looked there, you definitely should because a lot of the data is visual, which is easier to understand for a guy like me at least, especially when you see kind of a lot of the, the graphic trends that they have on the website are compared to the national averages or at least all the averages of similar public pension plans from other states. And you kind of get a feel for the health of the Virginia system versus the health of just public plans in general. And when I do, I look and see uh, Virginia's is pretty much on the average. They're not fully funded. Very few pensions are against current and future obligations. That's important to understand that the pension system is paying retirees now, but the actuaries have done the calculations and said, yes, but you've already obligated to pay this much in the future. So you need this number of assets in order to cover that amount of both currently and into the future. And then if they don't have those number of assets on hand, then you start seeing the 
funded status go down. Now, there are some important things that you should understand about funding status. The first is that very few public plans are fully funded. And there's several reasons for that. And actually, this website gives you a quick overall view of why that is. A number of the issues came from just underfunded, overpromising benefits and underfunding them. Also, there was an um, accounting method change in the late 90s, early 2000s, which basically showed a lot of pensions were underfunded overnight, whereas previously they had been showing 100%. Having both the dot-com bubble burst right at the beginning of the 2000s and then the great financial crash at the end of the first decade of the 2000s didn't help. But then most public pension plans after that kind of steadied out wherever they were. And that's the actuarial funded ratio for the Virginia plan has been fairly steady since eh, 2011 through 2019. And that's the most current data that's in the database for it. So it's been roughly trending right around 75%-ish of current funding versus future obligations, which isn't bad, but it isn't great. Ideally, you would want it to be funded at 100% or higher, but again, very few are. Some are in a lot more trouble than Virginia, though, is the other thing. Like there are pension systems in places like Illinois and Kentucky that are in the 30s as far as annual funding ratio goes. So you need to kind of take that in perspective, too. You know, the other thing that Virginia has going for it, they have quite a few assets on hand and they are in trend with the graying population. They have a lot of retirees retiring right now from the baby boomer generation. You know, once you get through those, you should see funding levels improve because there are just less Gen Xers and millennials and stuff like that within the pension system. So that's like a one-stop shop. The best place to go, uh, Troy, is the CRR's public plans data to get the overall impression of how well the pension is doing. And from that website, you can get into their annual reports and then get to any amount of data you kind of want to as far as, you know, in order to make it more well-informed decision on whether you think that pension benefit is going to come through as promised, because it's more than just that 75% number. In fact, the American uh, Academy of Actuaries, I think it's called the AAOA, wrote a paper several years ago saying that there's this myth about pensions that are funded at the 80% level. It has become this de facto gold standard of anything above 80% is considered well off and won't have problems in the future versus anything under a will. But the AAOA is quick to point out, like, there is no mathematical reason behind this general 80% level coming up. It's just something that pension funds chose one day as this level of advertising, like, hey, we're above 80%, so we're doing better. It's really about the trend lines of the funding ratio. So if the trend lines for the last five years has been going down, obviously there's an issue of concern. If you know you take a multi-decade approach and you see those trend lines continue to go down, then there's a smaller likelihood that they're going to be able to turn things around and actually increase their asset levels in order to meet all future obligations. On the other hand, if they're going up, you're in a much better system. What has happened since the great financial crash is pretty much up until this year, things have just trended or sideways. Like they haven't improved too much. They haven't degraded too much. They pretty much most public pension plans in Virginia is one of them. The VRS citizen is one of them. Just kind of moved sideways over the last decade since the great financial crash. Now, COVID is going to change that. And you need to understand that a lot of public money at the state level is being spent on all these uh, health measures, you know, that they've had to take state by state. And that means more than likely they're going to need cash since most states have a balanced budget requirement. That means they're going to be taking funds from other places. And one of the first places that funds typically get taken from is what would have been that year's contributions into the pension system. Some states will just do some, but not all. Some might skip entirely. And then what happens is then the actuaries have to go and roll this into the future payments over 30 years and say, okay, well, because you missed your payment or only did 50% of your payment last year, this year, you have to pay all 100% plus a previous amount over this 30-year period in order to get back to being at 100% funding. And the public pension plans database will show you that in visual detail. The previously unpaid portion is called ARC, and you don't want to see a, 
a huge ARC payment on top of a yearly payment in a pension system. Now, in 2019, VRS had no ARC payment. That means they made 100% of the payment that was required for that year, plus all of the ARC payment for previous years. You know, that is going to, most definitely is going to change this year because of all the money being spent at the state level on COVID. All the pension experts, the public pension experts, the people who run the CRR at Boston College have pretty much pointed that out. Unless, you know, Virginia or the other states choose to raise taxes, which is probably not going to happen anytime soon because a lot of people are out of jobs. And they, the, the other thing is they have reduced revenue coming in because people have lost jobs. Therefore, the state income tax isn't going to collect as much this year. So their, their expenses have gone up while their income, the state's income, has gone down. Now, Lindsay, you're in a unique situation is that this pension is it's, it's a little bit of a hybrid. I know it says VRS 1, 2, or VRS hybrid, but even the 2 is somewhat of a hybrid method because you have a certain amount of cash accrual piling up Mm -hmm. in which the the state is paying interest on that you could take with you when you go somewhere else. So it's important to know that not all systems do. Some systems are like, hey, the contributions go in. If you don't stay, the payment stays with us. But you're lucky you're not in that situation. You can potentially roll that over into an IRA and all your contributions are tax deferred according to the website. So you can keep those in a tax deferred status when you roll it over and they'll pay the interest as well. Now, I don't know if if there is a certain, um, like you have to do a certain number of years to get the full percent of contributions that you paid or not. Have you guys seen that anywhere on the website? I think I came across that on the website. The one piece of information I maybe found on the actual website, it, it did say, I think it's, you know, minimum of uh, five years. And then after that, you can request a full transfer. Okay. Yep. Cool. So you've met that threshold then. Yes. Good. All right. So, you know, that's a pro for leaving, in my opinion. You know, going back to those mental scales that I was talking about is you're getting something for your effort, even if you leave right now, which some people would not get. Like, certainly in my position in the the high three program, as it was called in the military when I joined, was not like that. Of course, we weren't making contributions either. It was all government contributions. But, you know, if we left prior to 20, we didn't get anything. So, a little bit better. It kind of goes back to that pros and cons list of all these kind of features that certain pensions have that other pensions don't. And if I haven't said it yet, you're in a pretty valuable pension system. Mm -hmm. Other than the funded ratio being kind of stuck at 75%, there's very few cons on your pension program itself. Okay. It seems rather generous. I will say, are you guys familiar with what's called the multiplier? Uh, I'm not. Mm Mm-mm. Okay, so your pension system, VRS, has a formula that is based on your age, number of years worked, and what your annual average salary is. So at the end, let's say you stayed to 30, at the end, they would take a certain number of years and average it to gather your salary and average that. And then they would use this multiplier for the number of years you worked. So they would say, hey, for every year worked, you get 1.7% of your average salary, okay? So, you know, you take 1.7 and add that 30 times together, that multiplier gets higher and higher, kind of the piece of the average salary that you get, the pie of that gets bigger and bigger the longer you stayed in, right? So the multiplier for VRS2 is lower than VRS1. I think it's around the 1.7 range. That's not the highest multiplier I've ever seen, but it's not the lowest either. So it's about average. So that in particular is neither a pro or a con, or at least that's, I listed it kind of in the middle, but you have other pros as well. You get your payments as long as you're at full retirement age, you know, they start right away. Some pension systems, you know, make you wait. So yeah, I mean, you know, there are things about your pension system and we kind of already mentioned the other ones like the COLA, the fact that it leaves social security intact. It has a lot of those OEPBs that I talked about. And yeah, the payments start right away. So as far as the plan goes, it's a pretty valuable plan if you were going to stay until 30 and earn the full payments. You'd mentioned earlier something about uh, health insurance. I I don't know if you know or not, but if you stay until full retirement age, do they give you the option to purchase health insurance through them or is it provided as part of the pension? So it looks like you accrue a certain number of credits for the length you stay. 
I didn't dive into the healthcare specifically, but it was mentioned in, in one of the catalogs I downloaded that the healthcare, it, basically they subsidize healthcare and that subsidy increases the longer you stay in the pension system, right? Now, if you were to leave the pension system and take your money with you, you, you won't get any of that. If you stay, you know, I think it's over 50 is the absolute minimum you have to be in order to start being able to withdraw your pension. So if you stay in at least there, you're going to get like a partial subsidy. If you stay in all the way to 30, it's probably going to be a, a much more full subsidy. But it did seem like it, it accrues on an annual basis. The, the longer you're there, kind of the more credits you accrue and that higher subsidy level you're going to qualify for. But I only glanced at it. So that is something if, if it's weighing on you. That is something that you need need to research further. Yeah, I guess um, I guess in talking with Lindsay about this, we had all I actually had assumed it was a really bad pension. You know, I, I just out glancing at it online and stuff, I thought it was a bad pension, and I, I just assumed that there wasn't any health care when you reach retirement age. So, I mean, talking with you has just kind of opened my eyes about how it's a pretty good pension. I didn't expect that, but it definitely makes gives us a lot to think about. Yeah, it's you know it's trending towards what I call the Cadillac or Mercedes-Benz uh, area <laughs> of pensions, right? Um, yeah, so you, it, you're right. That is going to weigh heavier in your decision because you're working in a more valuable pension system. If you were working in Illinois, in one of those pension systems that was only 30% funded, your calculation would be entirely different. Or if you were working in a pension system that didn't have a COLA, took your social security contributions and put it into the pension system, then you'd have a lot more cons against the pension system and that might make your decision easier. You know, I am all about just a fully informed decision or as informed as you could possibly be. And then it's up to the individuals from there to decide, you know, whether or not staying or leaving is right for them. Let's see, you had some, yeah, I think you have one other main question. I don't know. I think you hit everything. Lindsay, did you, did you have any questions? I don't think so. I mean, that's a lot of information. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm sorry. I just kind of verbal diarrhea at all. No, oh, no, it, I mean, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. No, yeah, you can see. So like, you know, I get kind of passionate about these things. <laughs> no, yeah, because we, um, you know, our main thing is that, and Lindsay can talk more about it, but it's, you know, I think it is, I like to have all the hard figures and numbers. And I don't think that's in our particular case is going to be the uh, the factor. I think it's going to have to be, you know, what we want as far as our family and what we picture our, you know, fire journey looking like. Yeah. Um, I, I was hoping you give me a, um, you know, a, an awesome equation that would just say, uh, you know, yes or no. But I know, I, I know from reading the first part of your book, that's not happening. <laughs> and yeah. So, I will say, because the pension has a COLA, you qualify for the easier mathematic um, pension calculation instead of the harder one. So again, it can be done. And you actually, you're on the easier path because you don't have to worry about inflation, assuming that the COLA starts right away. Yeah. Well, it's just going to be interesting. What I told Troy is that, you know, I, I am actually really enjoying, uh, I am working from home right now. We are virtual and I'm kind of enjoying this new challenge and that's also a consideration. It's like, maybe I'll hang in there longer because of this new kind of approach to teaching and, and all that. But I don't know. I don't know. I think, you know, we, we're thinking about having another child, you know, in the next few years, and then I don't know where my head, head will be at that point. So. Yeah. And so, and I'll tell you from experience, the second one changes the calculus quite a bit, um, <laughs> which my older brother warned me about, but I obviously didn't listen to. Right. And I'll say you guys are on the younger end too. So both mathematically and kind of like from the more uh, holistic issues of this pension means less to you right now than it would otherwise if you were older. If you were 20 years into, you know, fully qualifying for a 30 year pension, that would weigh differently. Both mathematically, that future pension would mean a lot more because you have less years to work a different job and save, you know, money in a different job than you would otherwise. But also from the holistic perspective is you have a lot more family kind of unknowns going on. And let's be honest, 30 years is an incredibly long time in this day and age to work a single job. Now, you know, you may not end up teaching the same grade every year. Maybe you move into administration at some point, but still overall you are working within the same system for 30 years. And that's just not the way 
most employment looks these days. In the private sector, it certainly doesn't look like that. In the public sector, is it's becoming increasingly less and less likely to look like that. And pension systems are changing as a result of that too. They're going to a lot more defined contribution and a lot less defined benefit, which is what you're, you have right now. Mm-hmm. And you know, the other thing is, and we haven't really talked about it, but teachers often get a lot of other ways to invest money. For instance, like a 457, I don't know if you have that at your um, availability or a 403B. So that's, you know, the public version of a 401k. So there are some other things you should be doing or could be doing in the meantime that makes jumping from that job easier because you're, you're piling up money in these other uh, savings accounts and investment accounts. And, uh, you know, something like 457 is ultra flexible as, as well. So, you know, even if you decide, hey, we're staying for now, but maybe not long term, you know, there are these other things that you could and should be doing in order to kind of just make yourself more flexible if and when you come to that point, like 10 years in the future. For my family's calculus, you know, I hit that breakdown point at year 17-ish. And um, one of my factors was I just hadn't saved enough otherwise. So the likelihood of me jumping from a military career at year 17 and finding a whole new career and being able to save up enough money that would equal what I would be bringing in as far as the pension goes was pretty much impossible. If I was going to jump at that point, it was going to be for some very strong reasons, probably centered around my health and what was best for my family. But again, you guys are started way earlier than me. So that is definitely a good thing. I'm not sure it makes your journey or your decision much easier, but it will make your journey more well-informed, I think. And I, you know, if you're open to the other possibilities of saving money in other ways, and if that's a possibility for you, then you have a lot more flexibility if and when you want to make that decision to go. Right. Well, cool. Awesome. Yeah. I think you, uh, I think you nailed it. You got everything. All the questions. You got our wish list. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, if you guys think of others, please feel free to email me at grumpusmaximus.com. Follow up if you got anything else. Uh, Maybe that as some of your research gets further and further along, uh, you develop different questions. Absolutely. Now that I know about your secret uh, website for finding out all the information, I'll probably get to do a deep dive this weekend on it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, it's great because you can bring up all the data, like you can go as deep or, or not as you want. You could stick kind of strictly on the visual level, or you could really get in there and and pull up the annual reports on the pension system and everything like that. Oh, that sounds like fun. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, I tell you, it's a great way to spend Friday night. (laughs) Yeah. Do you guys have any other questions right now? I don't think so. I'm all set. Yeah. It's a lot to think about, but you know. Yeah. It, and it's a, it's a complicated subject and um, we want to thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us because you were able to break it down very understandably, which, you know, I think I've, uh, you know, I've been ripping my hair out trying to figure out some of this stuff and um, that you're able to really help us out. Thank you. Yeah. Not a problem. Brad, great conversation. Huge thanks first and foremost to Grumpus for coming on the show and really breaking down this topic for Troy and Lindsay. I'll just say real quick for individuals that are interested in his book, you can find it at choosefi.com slash pension. Certainly go check out his website as well. He writes at grumpusmaximus.com and he talks really about all things pensions related. And uh, if you have ever had any lingering doubts, what is the health of my pension? And you heard Illinois and you happen to be in Illinois and you have that sinking feeling. Well, here's how you can go and quantify that and kind of find out how dire or how the real the situation actually is and what that means for your financial planning goals. Brad, fantastic episode, a lot of depth embedded here. And really, I think this is such a critical conversation to have when you're talking about mapping out your financial life to a 30 year career with one employer. Yeah, you're right. And I think a lot of people who have pensions, I mean, they they need to make some real in-depth considerations, both from a monetary perspective, but also from a psychological perspective. And I think Troy and Lindsay are, are grappling with both sides of that. And I guess on on the data side, and I love Grumpus's quote of, I'm all about a fully formed decision. And then it's up to the individuals to stay or leave, right? But the first part of that is the fully formed decision. And Troy said he was having a hard time finding anything other than the most superficial of information on this Virginia retirement program. But what was interesting was because Grumpus knows this stuff inside and out, he knew precisely where to look. 
And now our audience knows precisely where to look. Regardless, again, you know, this episode was very specific about Virginia, but it's so much broader than that, right? As you can take these concepts, you can take the questions Grump has asked, and you can expand them to wherever you live. So I just Googled really quickly Center for Retirement Research public plans data, or even just CRR public plans data. And we will have this in the show notes, but you can just Google this super easily. And it takes you right to the Boston College webpage and Center for Retirement Research at Boston College public plans data. And you can find all the info you need on your particular plan. And I think that really is, Jonathan, kind of how I look at Chooseify generally, right? It's like, you know, sometimes we'll talk about very specific things, but we always try to make it inclusive enough that you can extrapolate this to whatever your situation is. It's like a mental toolbox of how do I approach this? So yeah, that that in and of itself, just that one page was worth the price of admission today, right? It certainly was. And when you pair that with the Grumpmatic method, you know, this overly scientific process of uh, developing a pros and cons list that is pension related, uh, you'll have the golden ticket to your financial future. And I certainly think that what comes up over and over again in terms of points of consideration for people to consider is length of time to being able to vest or, you know, get some portion of that pension, whether or not you're going to have any sort of uh, cost of living adjustment or COLA. So is it going to keep up with inflation or is the value of this thing going to diminish over time? Is there some sort of healthcare allowance and is there some sort of survivor benefit? These were just a few of the factors that they mentioned in this episode. And then if I didn't say this, probably the most important component is, is your pension funded at an acceptable trend line level? And we would say fully funded to be hundred percent. That'd be great. No one's fully funded. Literally no one is fully funded pre COVID. It was trending around 80% and that was the bar, but what is it now? because states' budgets all got thrown completely into the air, you know, and lots of new programs, lots of new benefits, lots of tax revenue that's been depleted. You're really going to want to pay attention to that if you're making these decisions now. Is it healthier than it was before? Did it hold the line? Or are those numbers fundamentally flawed because they're all about a date that was pre what we just went through, pre Black Swan event? Does that change anything? So even if you were comfortable with the numbers the last time you checked, are you comfortable now? It might be time to go dust it off when the new budgets come out for each state. But, you know, states have balanced budget requirements and that means something has to give. What if it was the contributions to your state pension fund? You'd want to know that before you make, uh, you know, your long-term financial planning decisions around it. Yeah, that's certainly a good point. And also knowing that a lot of whether it's funded or not is based on actuarial assumptions, right, sure. Jonathan? And and things change even like we talk about with compounding, right? Like if you assume an 8% return versus a 7.5% return, that can dramatically alter the actuarial assumption. So I think the most important thing here is doing your research, keeping a sense, looking at this, as you said so intelligently, like looking at this over time, right? So you're going to be able to compare apples to apples with, hey, what is the fully funded for my plan as of today? What's it six months from now? What percent funded is it? You know, you could a year from now, whatever it is that like you can get a sense of this. So like you said, there are a ton of factors just to consider in the back of your mind. Another one, and I was very impressed with uh, your exhaustive list there. The only other one that I had that that I would add in was it seemed like Lindsay's pension did not take away from her being able to get social security, hmm. which Grump has said was unusual and very valuable. So wow. that might just be like an additional kind of wild card factor. The way that Grump has kind of intimated was that most do take away that possibility, but I don't want to put words in his mouth. So, you know, that was the sense that I got, but anyway, that's just another factor to add into the list. So yeah, I think it's, it really is just about having, as he said, just have that fully formed decision. And then at the end of the day, Jonathan, you need to decide like what works best for you. Just like we always say, not every decision comes down to money, right? I mean, you get a finite number of years on this planet. And if you've reached phi, sure, it might hurt to give up a potential pension that's worth X number of dollars, but do you need it, right? You might make that determination for your family that, you know what? No, I don't. Even if I'm 22 years into a 30 year potential retirement, like you might decide, hey, that's something I'm willing to give up. Other people might decide, no, that's crazy. I'm already more than two thirds of the way there. But it is a very, very personal decision. And it all starts with having that information. 
All right, my friends, hope you got value from today's episode. Uh, certainly, you know, follow us and subscribe on your podcast player of choice. And if you know someone that is struggling with the pension dilemma, feel free to share this episode with them. It's a complicated subject and it helps to have someone that's just intimately familiar with the variables to consider like Grumpus. I think this is a very accessible episode. And I think it's very shareable if you know individuals that are going through this uh, particular financial dilemma. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. If this episode was helpful to you, don't forget to subscribe. If you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your friends about us. We can be found on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to podcasts. While you're there, don't forget to check out our other shows like Everyday Courage with Julian Johnsrud and Rebel Entrepreneur with Alan Downigan. If you would like a free bite-sized course to jumpstart your financial independence, check out chooseify.com slash challenge. Chooseify is produced by Andrew Mendonca and Zachary Tan and is a production of Chooseify Media Incorporated. Chooseify.com is managed by Annie Sheely with William McVeigh, M.K. Williams, Melissa Lagerquist, Liz Kessler, Stephen Hettig, Kelly Black, and Jennifer Ma. And Ed T. is our CEO. Thanks for listening.